Hey, it's Ham Tag. I am live with Judd. So right off, woo, we're going to be doing top five. We're still doing our publisher series this time, obviously, Fantasy Flight Games. They're all about the bling, baby, the bling. All right. Now, before we go too much further, there's a lot of guys and maybe even gals that are popping in and they can't stay. That's cool. We get it. We love to have you on live. If you can't, you can't. Sometimes Judd and I can't, and then we just postpone the show. So, Judd, anything you want to say, and then I'll talk about what's currently getting ready to go on my table for review. Not that I know of. Trevor, I haven't watched a baseball game this year. I don't know what's going on. Sorry. There you go. <laughs> we actually were just chatting about that as we were getting ready to come on live. Now, Matt, I've got to say here, so they prefer Tom Shaw at 90. I missed the prior part of that. So uh, let me see. Staying out of trouble? Maybe that. I don't know. So that's in reference to, I just put out part one of uh, Thomas Shaw. Um, he couldn't come live. He's 90, he's 90 years old. And uh, he said he couldn't hear well enough to uh, do a live show. Or even I, I thought maybe we could do a uh, speakerphone, you know, call. He said, nope, even with my hearing aids on, I really can't, can't go like talk like that. I'm like, okay. So I came up with a 20 question system and then I put it together with a script and kind of used the books and material he sent me in the questions to create a show. And it was bigger than I thought. It was actually two hours, a little over two hours. And I've trimmed and cut and uh, holy moly, Judd, did that take up my time? I had no idea how hard it is to actually put a good thing together that's cut together. So I hey, like why. Didn't, didn't he play baseball? Oh, he loved baseball. He's like, I he think that's the like, reference. Oh, okay. I think it's a reference. The Yankees that prefer Tom Shaw at 90. Got it. Probably so. Probably so. That's a good point. I don't know why I missed that. I was thinking games, not uh, – let me come on down. So, let's see. Yep. All right. A lot of folks adding this to their watch list later. That's fine. So, um, I will tell you I've got GMT's Combat Commander Pacific. That's going to be going on the table. I just finished a review of eight Austerlitz 1805 from Trafalgar Games. That's a miniatures game where you can bling it with blocks or you can play it with counters. I actually like it with the counters. I do not like stickering stuff. Although I'm with Judd, I'll put a podcast on and I'll sticker to my heart's content. But uh, And they are a little harder to pick up. But I need to get Combat Commander in there. It got sent to me. I did an unboxing Pacific, I think right before COVID. and then. Literally all heck broke loose, and it was just down to doing the lives and some of my interview stuff because I just couldn't get filmed and edited like I wanted to. So, Judd, let's bring her back on topic here. So, Fantasy Flight Games. Fantasy Flight is like Ameritrash done double American style. <laughs> they are the kings. They're the kings of the stuff. I mean, there's good stuff, claustrophobia, Earth Reborn, Space Hulk, but, you know, game for game, those guys are the kings of the stuff. Yeah, they knew they knew how to throw a lot of stuff in the box. Um, just bling it, bling it, and then bling it some more. I've got a couple real interesting ones. And again, we've I've stated in the comments or in the, uh, the, the explanation of what we're doing, it's not purely war games. So I don't know about your list. Your list surely could be. They I have don't know. If they've made five what I would call war games. They, they do hybrids. Yeah, you know? and I think you're right on that. I mean, obviously, there's the, uh, the King Daddy that everybody probably thinks of in the tactical realm that may or may not be on at least one person's list. There's some foreshadowing. I don't know if it'll be on yours or not. But uh, so... Um, the other thing that was real weird, um, cause even as I looked, um, and there was one I particularly had in mind, the acquisitions that they pick up along the way, which can even cause confusion on BGG. Cause there'll be, um, well, I'll give you a, well, I don't want to foreshadow anything cause it's in my mention. So well, I guess we'll start and we'll just use the show to kind of explain as we go. What do you feel about that? You got anything you want to say? Yeah. I'll say this. I mean, it was funny. I went to my, <clears throat> I have a geek list. Basically once I get like 10 or more games by a publisher, I'll start to symbol. And then I'd also went to my, cause that has my formerly owned games as well. So I went to that and looked 
<clears throat> and then last night I thought, you know, I should go to Aaron. That's Mr. Marino on BGG, who's the king of Ameritrash. And there's plenty of games I don't get because he's the only one that plays them with me. They're not really something I'd want to solo, but he's the only one that – if he already has it, why do I need a copy? Right. So I went to his – list and looked at his stuff it's like oh man i forgot about that 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 i had to reshuffle my list last night at like 12 30 or one in the morning just getting ready to go to bed just took a quick look so yeah because he's the king of ameritrash they're the publishing kings of ameritrash so anyways you're good now I, i'm gonna do a little roll call now vorpal bite he's more of a straight up historical war gamer. So he's, he wants to know what kind of war games I got. Vorpal, I'm not sure you're going to like this show. I'm just going to tell you that right off the bat. I can tell you they at least have one. <laughs> Although the grogs aren't into it. It <laughs> would qualify. I know what you're talking about. Yeah. Cause I think uh, everybody does worst kept secret, but yeah, yeah it's, you know, if you're in the ASL, you're not going to be into what they offer for it. Right. And it'll have too much toy factor. So we got Matt Curiosities is in. Trevor was in. I think Trevor's back out. Um, let's see. We've got uh, Vorpal. Vorpal Bite is in. Espen FR. I'm wondering if that's France or something. I don't know, of course. But uh, he was in or she was in. And they're going to come back and watch later. A lot of that going on. I should be out mowing. I, uh, I got so busy at work. I came home and got half the yard mode. <laughs> And then it got dark and then I was mowing with the lights on. And then I thought I'm probably now interrupting folks at dinner. So I stopped and, and the yard does not look good. I will be doing that later. Yeah. Um, you better get on. It's supposed to rain on Tuesday for like three days. and get cold. Oh, It'll be, it'll be done today. 93 degrees out, but I'll be doing it. Um, let's see. That's, uh, that's on the list. I'll be getting that done. There's a few other things on my list. Um, whoops. It just jumped on me. Enrique Romero is in. Um, let's see, John, uh, I can never say your name, John. I'm so sorry, Petor, Torak, sure I'm messing that up. Charles Latora, Klaus Bras, Bras, I'm sure I'm saying that wrong as well. And Down River Rick, um, I'll work on it. And if you're in here more often, as Matt Curiosities will tell you, I actually start to get good at saying your name. Um, it's like cav cavalry. Eventually, oh. we get it. Yes, yes, uh, cavalry. I I just when I was actually doing eighteen oh five Austerlitz, I wrote a note, put it right on a sticky note next to the game, and I was like, anytime I had to look at it, look at it, and then when I'd mispronounce, I would come back and do it again, and I think I still messed it up once. As soon as I start like not, you know, I'm just flowing. I'll say. I'll say Calvary, and then everybody goes, hey. I'm going to start this one off, brother. Okay. So um, this is, um, I'm going to clarify the box I have is for a pre-version to, uh, to what Fantasy Flight picked up. Of course, this is the Days of Wonder. Whoops, get the glare See, off. I didn't include that because my copy that I used to have was Days of Wonder. So yeah. One of my rules is if it's on here, it's actually fantasy flights version of it. So well, I, 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 will, talk, I will talk about the fantasy flight version of it. Okay. I, I like that. It's, it's part of the Borg system that's on there. And the way I've got my camera, I'm going to drop Vorpal's deal here. Hold on. Let me see. We're going to go like that. And we'll go like that. So, um, but I will tell you, I like the fantasy flight picked it up. Um, it's, it is, and Fantasy Flight did it as more of a fantasy think D and D. They have the two names of the two factions. Um, they blinged it out with their plastics and their bigger monsters, and it is the Borg system. With I think they even still called it lore, so they still use the lore system, the points to do certain things. But. Um, had they stayed truer to what Days of Wonder had done, which was a little bit of a mix match. It was the, the medieval 100 years war with fantasy kind of just tacked on with spiders, earth elementals. I can't remember what else. Dwarves and elves. Well, yeah, they had all that. They had the, yeah. the, the orcs. Even and all archers. That. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and so I like this version better. I was glad when Fantasy Flight put it back out. As soon as I looked at their version of it, I was like, 
I'm not going to move to that because I think I would always want to play this, which is the system you – it's the guys on the podcast. They called it, if you've got this and you're never going to play the other, why get it? I can't remember what it's called. But – I Theory? Still, say it again. Jones Theory? Bingo. That was what I was okay. reaching for. So I'm staying with this, and I know this isn't the box, but I – and I know – it's it's slight, almost not. It's in the same world, but done differently by Fantasy Flight. But I wanted to get it in there. Um, clear war game on the lighter side of things, and I also feel it was like a gateway, kind of a gateway game to the Borg system in general. And I'm going to tell you right now, any which way we can get folks into the Borg system, it's one huge gateway door to war gaming and historical. War gaming, boom! That's my number five. Yep the um, that's the only board game I traded, but it was Pierre Jones theory. It was the combat system played kind of like Command and Colors Ancients Light. It had certain parts. I think it had support, um, and I don't know if it had like the momentum built into it and the battle backs. I don't remember exactly because it's been a while, but it had parts of Ancients but not quite enough of ancients. The lore system was the cool part of it. Yes. Because you didn't get gathering these tokens for certain things. You could take actions, I think, to get tokens, and then you would use those, and you'd have these cards. It's like your combat cards, if you're familiar with Napoleonic's Expansion 5, um, Command and Colors Tricorn, uh, Memoirs, Winter Wars, and um, but you had to spend so many lore points. It's like you had these powerful wizards on your side, Gandalf, mm -hmm. the white, or, although he didn't technically do it, but, you know, <laughs> doing stuff. <laughs> and it was, that was a pretty cool system. The combat system left me wanting, and the theme was so weird. When you're fighting um, Agincourt with dwarves and spiders and elves right. and human archers. Yes. Kind of bizarre. I thought, why didn't you just make it Wars of Middle Earth or something? It would have worked a lot better. Yeah. Why I, didn't I, you supplement historical battles with fantasy creatures is weird i agree i wish they would have i wish so we're on days of wonder there but i wish they would have gone full fantasy that's why i liked what fantasy flight did they went full fantasy um but then for me it actually dumbed down the borg system a little bit i think the board's a little bit smaller um there's some things that I just like, no, nah, I don't think I'll play that version over this version. So, but I'm glad they did it. It worked as a, again, I, I believe the Borg system is the gateway war game. Yeah. I think it's, it's probably the main one. At that time when I sold, when I traded or sold it, whatever I did, I had Ancients, um, Napoleonics and Memoir and Battlecry. And I noticed it was always the one getting left off. And I just thought it's it's the pure Jones theory. Now I still I've added since that time the um, American Revolution, but I haven't got all the stuff. But I I'm still willing to play any of those five I have quite a bit. I just noticed, and then the other part was Days of Wonder system. Their expansions were really expensive. You know, I wanted the dragons. I wasn't paying that much for like three dragon pieces or whatever. I was right. like, dude, seriously, you got to right. learn what you did with memoir. Yeah, make them affordable. But it's almost felt like it was a it wasn't a collectible game, but it almost felt like it was moving that direction. I thought I I can't get these expansions. I'm done with it. But and I, I picked a lot of those expansions up. Um, and then when the new system was like when Fantasy Flight announced, some people were dumping some of their their old stuff, and uh, because they liked the idea that it was more it looked more like a D and D again. I can't remember the two names of the factions, but it was like evil blue against or i mean good blue against evil red and you had like hell figures on one side and then more like flying angel type valkyries on the other but i picked up a few literally that way and i liked how the powerful elementals the spiders in the core box there's a there's another guy i can't remember who was another uh, special oh the hill giant and uh, yeah. i liked i liked how those worked but I'm with you. Neither one of these really n niched into where I thought they would beat out other CNC games. So, you know, the, 
something Nathaniel had commented. I, something I was going to mention earlier and forgot to was I made a joke with Aaron when, we, when he taught me. Um, oh, what is that game called? Um, Rune Wars. Um, that I think they pay their designers based on the amount of chits, cards, <laughs> decks. Because just because you have a hundred cards, it matters if it's because they have tiny cards on a lot of stuff. Ten yep. decks. Yes. And plastic. It was some type of formula based on this because, man, their games were – when you set them up, it was a lot of setup because you had all these decks everywhere. And so, um, anyway, so, yeah, that was my joke about this. So, you ready for my five? Yep. Oh, Throw right. it in. I'm just throwing up some names because Subcomandante is in. Sorry. Go ahead. My number five is Star Wars X-Wing. Ooh. Um, that was the call right there. Yep. The uh, yeah, if you're familiar, uh, what was it called? Wings of War, I think, and then yep. it may, maybe Wings of Glory. They changed it to. It I reminded have me, Wings of War. It reminded me of like the successor to that in a sci-fi. It's not, you know, this. Well, actually, the one of them had miniatures, but um, it's a lot different. And I'm not saying it's like it. It feels like it's a successor to it. You can feel the influence. The um, it's a miniatures game, and you play it on a table. And it's it's really fun because you don't have to get too realistic with Star Wars because if you know your physics, it breaks the laws of physics. You can't do barrel rolls in outer space, <laughs> not without atmosphere. <laughs> but hey, it's like if I, I read comic, you know, I said, hey, I read comic books for years and years and years. I can I can work with anything. I'll, I'll roll with you as long as you don't go too absurd. Um, but you get these. It's pretty cool. You got these little maneuver discs. I don't know if you ever played it. But you pick your maneuver, then reveal it simultaneously. Then you got these little templates, and you put it next to your ship. And like if it's a barrel roll, you put it there and just move it to the side. Exactly. And then they're color coded, like green, red, and white. And red is like a really difficult maneuver that like stresses your pilot out. And you're not allowed to do a red and think until you get a green maneuver done, which is more like flying straight or something real easy to calm calm the nerves. So it has a built in like gaming restriction to it. Um, and when you go to fire, like your little your little square piece at, at the base of your um, miniature has these arcs at the at the corner points, and you put this piece down. If they're inside your arc, and it has three different links on your t on your fire template, it's like a little piece of cardboard. Either severe damage, medium damage. You know, if, if you're out of range, you, you know you have to hit their base. And then once you do that, you're rolling dice, and they roll dice. This is a common fantasy flight thing. I score so many hits and you have to score so many canceling of hits. And then they have pilots with abilities, um, things like this. And then they have pilot cards that can kind of balance it out. Now, the thing about Star Wars, I had the Force Awakens. This is not an endorsement for the new trilogy. The new trilogy sucks. Brian Johnson <laughs> is the Antichrist. He ruins all that is good in life. Um, but I thought the, I thought it was going to be decent after the first movie. And I found this for cheap. I just wanted to play. Um I guess the game went to a second edition because they had a, a problem that they had was power creep. The new ships got bigger than the too powerful. I don't know. I'm not that into it. Um, a guy, it was funny back at tornado alley. Um, it's a local gaming convention. Bart's wife host. Um, I was playing, I was teaching hands in the sea. That's how long ago it was before it came out. And this guy was sitting there. I was teaching him and playing and he told me he watched hand tag. I'm like, really? And he was from town. And we got to talking, and um, we, we wanted to game some more. And I told him my kids were at church Wednesday night, so he, and I'd play in the lobby by myself. Like, you, you know, you show. And so he showed up, and it's funny because I explained to my wife I had ham tag Greg and church Greg, different Greg. <laughs> but he'd roll in with his X-Wing stuff, and he had this big collection. And we just, okay, let's do this and this, three on two. Your, one of your ships is a little more powerful. And we just go at it. And we played that time and time again. We went up to the game store and played. and I mean, down at the Heroes Complex uh, game night and play that thing. And if you know somebody that has it, it's really fun. You don't have to buy all this stuff. I've got this, which I think was a couple of TIE Fighters and an X-Wing, which is kind of expensive for what it is. And then when I was on Board Game Co., out that guy who trades and sells games, I just – see a couple of ships and throw them in to balance out a trade. So I think I've got like um, Darth Vader's looking TIE fighter. If you remember that from the mm -hmm. original star Wars movie yeah, yeah. and a Y wing and L with something like, I got, I got like six or seven ships. You just mix and match them. So I'm not into the huge fleet battles having to have everything. And you don't need it. All you need technically is one-on-one -on -one or, you know, it's a little more fun if you have about 
you know, three to five ships. I mean, you have a few ships out there. You can do, you know, wingman and break off, try to set up, you know, all kinds of little fun things. It's not too detailed, but it's pretty fun. It's fast. And best of all, it's easy. And I like the combat system better than Wings of War. Wings of War is trying to be a little more realistic or, uh, but this one, you know, when I have, when you roll hits and I roll cancellations of your hits, um, I like that. It, it adds a quirkiness to it. It's not just an automatic hit. It's a wild factor. Like maybe you had him dead to rise and still screwed it up. Or, you know, like Darth Vader, I have him now. You know. So anyways, that that's my number five, Star Wars X-Wing. So. Very nice. Very nice. Well, different game, but same license is Rebellion. This is thick and big, so this this will get that fantasy flight. They all start to go to these huge uh, shelf hogs on here. And Rebellion was a slow creep for me because I thought, well, I like it for the Star Wars theme, but I wasn't sure what is that going on. And then a buddy of mine at work had it and was like, this is phenomenal. And... Um, I went over and played it with him, and then we switched sides. So the key is you've got the asymmetric powers, and it's a cat and mouse hide and seek kind of thing, where one person's playing the rebels, and you've got a your secret base, and the and the the imperials are trying to find it, and then you got cards with your different players that allow di different abilities to do, and then you're trying to you're pledging to bring on different kinds of ships, and then it's and it's the the empire trying to find out where is that hidden base and you can do feints where like um, I think uh, we had some epic moments where one of them, you know, I was like, it's gotta be over there, but it seems like he's pointing me that way by defending heavier over there. And I, and so I was playing him and the game, which was what I like. And so I thought, man, and he knows if I go that way and it's wrong, He'll have it because there's no way I could get my fleet back over my powerful one to do what needed to be done. And so it was tense right down to the end. And every time we play, what we want to do is play twice. Usually we can only get one in because it's nice to play. Hey, I'll play this side. You play that side. And then you can switch and play again. And it's fun that way. So um, what else do I have in my notes? Well, ultra thematic. It really feels like that, that, you know, where is the rebel base kind of thing. Um, you do have, uh, you do have, uh, the star destroyers in there. You have everything you have, uh, you have, uh, death stars in there. You even have one that's being built so you can, you can kind of bring in all three. So, um, again, themes through the roof, toy factor through the roof. They always do theme, not always. They really, really know how to ha take the theme and, and, put it into the, to the toy factor. And then it makes for a great game. I think it's hard to find an asymmetric game that'll fit the theme and still have tension and have a lot of variability based on what you do and the cards you get. So um, my number four, if I played it more, really, uh, I tried it with Bo here and he was like, yeah, it's okay. But he, you know, trying to figure out how to hide, how to faint, how to play the cards it can be a little overwhelming. So that's that's why it's up there. It does not hit the table often, but even after playing his, I thought Bo will like this, so I bought my own. Um, didn't quite work out with the uh, Homestead Gaming, but uh, it it they did a heck of a job here. Have you played it? Yeah, leave it up there. Okay. Oh. Because that's my really? four. Woo. And I don't own it. Ah, well, here it is. So you That was the one when I went through Aaron's list last night and looked. I go, oh, shoot, they did make Rebellion, didn't they? Mm -hmm. And if he and I played it more, it might be number one. I mean, it, so, you know, COVID partly shut us down, and we have a long list of games and things like that. But, yes, and when I make my top 100 out, every time I put it in there, he chastises me for not being higher, and I would say, well, maybe you should play it with me more, dude. Um, the uh, – it's yeah, the toy factor's amazing. The uh, I love how they have the full Death Star and the the Death Star from Return of the Jedi. Uh, I don't remember what they called Calamari the the it's a trap that guy. Mm -hmm. Akbar his race. They're real powerful battleships in there. Um, you're spending points to build stuff, so you got to manage that part. You're trying to and it did such a great job of capturing the theme of the fourth move, uh, episode four the, about the hidden base. Um, funny story I had in there was. 
they they I captured somebody, I don't remember what it was, and they set up a rescue mission and I ended up capturing the Millennium Falcon. I got Chewy and then turned him to the dark side. <laughs> <laughs> Which <laughs> you know. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but but I mean you you score huge if you and what's cool is you every turn I think you get two character cards you draw randomly so you don't know what you're going to get you have to keep one and put one back so if you get like luke and han uh yeah i'll keep luke and he's like holy cow you just discarded Han, yeah um, and you get him on your side and get their special power so it's huge if you can get luke and then turn him to the dark side which that's in there that's why i said such a great job of the, of the thematic feel also cool it has the map of the galaxy and it has the prequels and the the middle movies it does not Fortunately, it came out before those garbage movies came out, so we don't have to put up with that noise. <laughs> but it's pretty cool when you're looking at it and you see Naboo and uh, uh, Coruscant and all those, you know, the um, Tatooine, all these different places, Geonosis, that they're all on there, you, you know. And um, I, I don't remember if the planets had different production values or certain strategic because there was a military aspect into it. That's why I said that's one of those. It's kind of a war game. There's a war going on, but it's not what Grogs would call a war game. It's one of those you'll see list up and somebody put my war games and you get on and you see games like that. Like, okay, he's trying, but he's yeah. not really a Grog or close to well, it. But yeah, it's got wow. that high level strategic feel to it. And you're definitely having to project into the future. And then also you can't be so obvious on what you're doing or you will lose. I mean, and then you got some other things where you can move and you can do, you know, you can move it around, but it does that so well. And I'm, that's why I agree with you hundred percent. If I played this more often, it would be higher. It just didn't resonate as much in the house. And then when I'm with the other guy, um, we're usually playing something different than this. Although every once in a while, he'd be like, Come on, man, because his he's got a twin brother, but his twin doesn't like it as much as him. So he'll be like, hey, we got to play this again. And I'll be like, yes. It's like almost like I never turn it down. Yeah, it'd be one that if I'd love to, I mean, it won't solo. I don't think it will. I mean, you're hidden base. Sheesh, you're yeah. trying to bluff him. Any right. game of bluff just solo goes out the door. Um, and if, if I could solo it, I would grab it and play it play it quite a bit i've now, actually looked at trading it but it came down to air and has it why do i need it the only thing i'm surprised they haven't done my buddy even picked up the expansion i don't remember what it is there's an honorable mention i'll put out where and i know people don't like apps but um the app made that game so much better and made it really soluble and i always wondered that if they had an app playing you know one of the other sides and uh, I think it would work best if they were the rebels and you're hunting and enforcing the push of where the hidden base is. Um, you know, I haven't dug into it too far, but I always wondered if they couldn't come up with an app for it that would make it solo play. But, you know, it's selling out good enough. Why would they spend time on, a, on an app? But yeah, that, that's what I thought would work. Kind of like how uh, Carrier Battles feels like Carrier and it, and it solos. I, it's designed that way. It's so awesome. You can play two player too, but it's just phenomenal. You know, some fantasy flight does really well is um, remember like in the seventies and eighties, when you see these games based on TV shows or movies and they were terrible. Yes. Emergency. Um, yeah. Love the, emergency. Love the TV show. It's just a boring game. Anyways, you, generally that was when I hit the, you know, late nineties, when I'd see something with a name on it, my automatic thought was sucks. Mm -hmm. But Fantasy Flight has done a great job of picking up these licenses and making really good games out of them. Um, so that's something that I mean, it's not easy. Now, I've seen collectible card games. I played the Terminator one. It was stupid. I mean, I killed Sarah Connor and the and humans still have a chance to win. I'm like, did you not see the movie? <laughs> um, so um, that's the thing. These guys really do well. They take it. They take it. They get the theme. They make a fun game out of it. There's other ones they have, but I can't mention them. Because they may or may not be able to. I don't want to spoil it. No, they they really are. They're not the best. There's another company I like a little bit better for marrying theme, but Rebellion's perfect. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, it just it feels like the Star Wars in a box. So, yep, yeah, they did good. So that was sure. your number four as well. Let's see. Yep. Uh, hold on, we got to get to Pluribus Rex in here. Anytime somebody says Ham Tag for Life, that's got to be in there. Um, all right, so we will go to um, my number three, 
which is Lord of the Rings, The Confrontation. So this is a Reiner Knizia game. Now, I love Reiner's games, so I'm, I'm a sucker for Reiner's games anyway. But this, I can explain it to you, and you will totally get it. It's Lord of the Rings with Stratego with cards added and the board turned this way, so it's like a diamond instead of the square. It plays in 15 minutes. The powers are totally asymmetric, as you would imagine. You're just trying to get uh, uh, Frodo into um, uh, Mod Mordor, um, and there's some other conditions, one of which is if, uh, if they're able to kill Frodo, then they win. But there's three things, but it is so fast, 15 minutes, it is puzzly. You have hands of cards, and the cards have similar powers for both, but they're slightly different tweaked for who you are um, and how you play them. You have to play them all, and then once they're all played, you can shuffle, but there's some magic where you can pull one of your cards out. And Again, I won't try to teach it here. It is one of those games where if you get in four or five plays, you start going, Oh wow, I could I could faint here and they'll think it's there, but then they can do this, but then they can try and it's just here's a sad story. My wife does not like it. <laughs> <laughs> she played one side and said, Ah, oh, it's weighted to your side. So we after I won, we flipped and then I won even faster. And she was like, mm, I don't like this game. I'm like, no, no, no. I should have tanked, but I didn't. Um, so this game, it's light. So it's it's like Stratego with great theme and a Reiner Knizia depth of strategy that you don't see until you've played it a few times. Um, and I use it more like a uh, it's a great quick filler for two players. So it's a it's a good filler for two players. Problem is, both people need to have probably played it a few times for it to work as a filler. Otherwise, it's frustrating for the other player. But. Um, Phenomenal game. It's currently out of print. I even looked at maybe selling it, and then I went and played it with a buddy again. I'm like, nope, keeping it. Love it. So, Lord of the Rings Confrontation. I have played that, by the way. It's a good game. It is. This is like the deluxe version or something where you you can go to uh, – it gives a whole nother set of cards or heroes or something. You can flip them to the other side. So, it gives you a little bit more replay. Mm -hmm. Ability you can tweak it to I forget what they call it, but the pieces um, are taller too. Your pieces are like that. Nah. Yeah, the, uh, mouse is about this tall. Where yeah. the ones the ones in the original, which I had, I was looking to see if it was easily grabbable, but it's not. Um, they're like that tall. So yeah, and your the cards new, the taller ones have like more descriptions, I think, on them. And they're tarot cards that you're playing in your hand too. Because what you do is when you get into the same spot as somebody. And again, it's on that triangle side as you're moving up. You you each play a combat card. I forget what it's called. You play a card, and then you secretly reveal that. And sometimes they'll cancel each other out, or say, or it's your number added to the number of the of the card that you had on the table, and whoever's higher wins. And but it's just there's some there's some little like feints you can do that are really subtle and nice. It's a really well done job by Reiner, and. Uh, there you go, my number three. And that's not the only Lord of the Rings game he made with him either. That is true. That is true. Anyways, there you go. All righty. My number, you ready for my three? I am. Because I'm not moving this beast till I have to. Uh -oh. There's Magnus. Bar, he knows what it is. Ooh, tired of iron. Oh, we gotta go. Hold on, hold on. What wrong full screen? We got to go full screen with you. Why am I groaning? Because this thing has two expansions in it along with the base game. <laughs> this weighs way more than um, Steve Jackson's Ultimate Ogre. <laughs> I had to reinforce the corners of this thing. Actually, I will pop it open for a second. Yeah, I have not one, two Plano boxes. All kinds of decks of cards sorted out in, in their baseball card plastic holders. Yeah, all this stuff going on in here. Um, lots and lots and lots. These are what weigh so much is the map boards because they're yes. very thick. They're very Not thick. Pieces. Yep. I'm going to put this thing down. Ah. This is one advantage of having this 
remotely. If I'd have been at your house, there's no way I'm bringing this monster. No, <laughs> I'd, I'd bring. I'd bring yeah. an empty box cover. Yeah, your trick is you bring the lid. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Otherwise, anyway. you blow out the sides. Just making a turn too quick, and you're going to bust the side on that box. That's the coffin box, baby. Yeah, that's what, that's what this they. This is the original it. Fantasy Flight one before One A did it. I don't know exactly what the case is. If I thought it was like a real big fan of the game, kind of took it over, but I don't know. Maybe somebody else has that story. Yeah, but, then, uh, then they went under. So yeah, um, but yeah, and behind me up there, uh, actually, my eighty second Airborne license plate is covering it. I was like, man. I'm always backwards in the camera right there. That's covering one of them. And then over here, there's the other expansions. <laughs> um, yeah. So, yeah, that thing. Okay, they come out with the base game, which I believe is Western. Yeah, it is purely Western Front. Then they came out with uh, Normandy. I think I might have mentioned this in a previous video. Aaron got that thing for me for like five or ten bucks at a ding and dent sale at Geekway of the West because it had a hole in the box. Right. I don't care. I emptied the box out, put the contents in here. That's part of why I have it in there. I still have the box back there. But, um, and then they made the Days of the Fox on North Africa. And then they may, I think 1A got hold of him then. And they may, or no, they had Fury of the Bear also, which is Eastern Front. Yep. Fury. And they did Stalingrad, which I, I don't know. Yeah. I haven't played Stalingrad. You did a review on it. Mm -hmm. I wish they would have went to the Pacific. That's the only bummer about the system is they never went to the Pacific. Um, so, uh, but anyway, so the system is this is their, their war game. Now, it's the Graws, like I said, if you're in ASL, you know, you're into. Um, MMP's big Dean Essig games, you're going to see, right, it's not a war game, there's plastic pieces in it. <laughs> God, my sister's not realistic enough and I'm chucking buckets full of dice. You know, that kind of thing. But yes, it's a historical war game. How much simulation is in each one is there. They all have different degrees of them. Um, the, yeah, the, uh, it has beautiful plastic pieces in it. You have these stands, you compose your groups, the different, you know, one guy might be regular infantry, and I think they have like a, I don't know, he's like, like a scout or ranger or something, these special powers. The mortar crews, they take up two spaces on, out of your four spots in your, on your piece, and that's each one of them like your squad. And machine gun groups, things like this, beautiful tanks. Um, you get your objectives in the game. They have the, the tile pieces like you'd see in a memoir where you specialize or you set the board up to do things. You got cards in. Of course, it's Fantasy Flight, so you got lots of cards. Um, lots of cards, like 100 and I want to say like 150 cards. Yeah. You have a battle for initiative. You can put tokens out. You spend these token things to see, or you can use them to do different powers. Uh, what's cool, the combat system is much more interesting I like this part of it. When you go to fire, you can you choose either basically like a suppression fire or a kill fire. Mm -hmm. And you're going to have so many dice you're going to roll. It's a, it's a bucket full of dice game. And I, I, if I remember right, you have to hit like a six to get the kill shot. And each mm -hmm. one each one you score, um, actually, you're going to roll, and then they're going to try to roll dice to cancel against you. Yeah, it's back to the canceling. Yeah, each one. That's a very fantasy flight combat system. Each one that gets through... If it's you have to pull a guy off your stand, um, if you're aiming at it, so um, but the suppression fire is a lot better, and what it, it basically suppresses them. And so you can do the find and fix them, flank, find and flank, sorry, find and uh, fix them, flank and finish them, the four Fs. <laughs> so you can do that because up close assault combat's much more effective than distance firing, and that's pretty cool when you figure that out. Uh, when I was playing the North African one, it was really, really amazing how those ADAs were just tearing those tanks up. I was like, yeah, this got a good feel to it. I mean, so, uh, but yeah, very customizable board, lots of scenarios in this thing. But yeah, the combat says is pretty neat. Like I said, there's different, you spend actions, you can move, you can do like an assault fire, which is less effective because you're moving and fire and you can stand still and fire, which is more effective, but not particularly effective at long distances. Um, so uh do you need special dice now the regular d6s sorry comment on there um sure. just bunches of d6s you get in this game um so um anyways that's one of one of my goals kind of like i got that one where i'm working through the napoleonics 
all the command and colors Napoleonics. And Tom and I are going to start picking that up and making our vassal games. That Now that I've taught him that, I want to go through all the scenarios, just play them, just get them going. I, you know, I'll play it, pick up, play one or two, and then put it up for the year. I'd like to really just go at it full out and play everything from, because I haven't even opened. When 1A, when basically Fantasy Flight said we're done with Tide of Iron, I jumped on their Christmas sale and thought this is probably my last chance. So I grabbed Fury of the Bear and Stalingrad. I haven't opened them yet. They're still in their cellophane. So I've yep. got a lot of stuff to work through. So I can't comment on those. I played the the North African one. Um, anyway, so it's, it's a really cool system. It looks really, really sharp and great, like great component piece. I've shown you the, the, the and lots and lots of chits for various things. It's fantasy flight is what they do. So, if, but the problem I think it had was a grog. I, I used to say back then it was a game without an audience. And that was one of the few cases where Aaron got rid of his game saying, well, he has it. He'll be the only guy to play it with me. As I kept mine, but uh, the grogs are, are going to turn their nose up to it. And I think their audience was more for the fantasy flight, the Meritrasher, who probably looked at the game as more complex. I not memoir. exactly what you're saying. Yeah, they probably saw it as, wow, this is the upper limit of what I would do to play a, quote, war game. Yeah, it is the next step up from memoir, but it's I'm, – I'm that weird dude. You know, when I want to when I want to play serious, I get out my band of brothers. You know, Greg Coleman if you want to play ASL, sure, yeah. But I, lo I love my memoir because I love the whole command and colors. And I, I, I like Ancients better, but yeah, I'll play memoir. It's fun. It's easy. The way I have it set up in my Plano system, I have where it's easy to set up and take down, which is your problem with it. But um, Tide of Iron, a lot of memoir players that I see that aren't really war gamers or not really very much taking that next step in war gaming are going to say Tide of Iron is a little too much for them. Plus, it's big box. It's a big investment. I think the game was like 70 bucks when it came out or something or 80. But um, so it almost seemed like it was a game without an audience. So it's not nearly as popular. I liked it a lot because I'm that weirdo that I love Ameritrash. I love dudes on a map and I love to fight a historical combat. So I think that's kind of a more limited audience. Um, so anyways, that is my number three, Tide of Iron. Well, my number my two. Number two. Kaboom, Kaboom, baby. baby. <laughs> so um, you, you've hit everything right on the head here. Let me jump in and say the other thing that happened to me with this system. So I like it. I'm going to come back to how you, it's like a scaffolding where you can just, well, we'll come back to why I say scaffolding, but this, although I like it and I picked up everything just like you did. And I got a bunch of one, a stuff as well. Some of it still in shrink. Um, it lost out in the tactical system to Conflict of Heroes for me. So this, um, as a tactical system, I, I actually like it, but it has a bit more, well, a lot more of a toy tactical combat situation, uh, you know, situation where, um, well, I'll just be honest. I like the way Conflict of Heroes works better, and I... I don't know if you can say realistic, but moving the toys around, although the system's still good, I definitely was like, okay, I like Conflict of Heroes better. And I, at the time, I did not want multiple different tactical systems. I was looking for which one am I going to enjoy the most. I did that. Why? Figured that out. And then I was all in on Conflict of Heroes. But I did the same thing when some of the games were coming up really inexpensive and I did not dislike this system. Um, but it was for me, tactical wise, the toy factor was a little bit up there and a little more fiddly with moving things. However, to go back to the scaffolding, um, I think it, I, I think you are spot on that. I wish it had sold better for them because I think it would have gone over to the Pacific. It was so easy to just say, Hey, here's these cards that cover kamikaze or here's um, you could have a card that makes the Japanese better at night. I mean, it is so easy to do that. And then the little chits that, that go onto the stand that can add in different things, or you can kind of equip differently. It really scaffolds up in order to have a, an entire system 
that's easy to adjust to east front, west front, Stalingrad, whatever it is, just like you said, uh, North Africa. So uh, the sad thing is when I was getting ready for this, I was like, I'm definitely going to use my coffin box version. But then the, I think I picked up the 1A version of this as well because it was, it was ridiculously inexpensive. And I was curious, how did they take all of this and put it into a normal kind of Memoir 44 style box? And I had it sitting at the bottom underneath three other of the same 1A games. And the dang paper on the bottom was stuck to my shelf because it had been there for probably since I got it. I had to get a spatula out and try to gently get it off of. And I still lost some of the paper backing. And I was... I was a little mad this morning because I thought, well, maybe I'll show the comparison. Ah, uh, brutal. But tied of iron, you said it best. Um, you you nailed why I think it got lost. Um, it's not a grog game, and it's heavy for a Euro gamer that's interested in war games. And then for me, as the I prefer tactical war games, especially World War II. So I was like, oh yeah, but then it it hit me on more of a toy ish factor, although it's still crunchy. Tactically, it had a toyer feel, a kitty feel to it a little bit. So that was just my deal. It's not, but it's, and I actually like the way the minis look, uh, but it did make it a little fiddly. So. Yeah. I don't think Aaron was that big and he didn't hate it, but I don't think he, you know, he hates Euro games, but um <laughs> But I don't think he was really that much into it. I think that's part of what he sold it. He just didn't do much for me. And we never really got it on the table, so I solo it all the time. I was going to show this. When I showed the right side, this was underneath. This is I showed the two small Plano boxes full of chips. Mm -hmm. You this said full of what? Full of what? C-H-I-T-S. Yeah. I don't want to get demonetized. That My phone can't understand what I say when I when I took when I was writing Mark Kerman on France 1944, and I would talk about the chit pull. <laughs> just seeing what my phone voice thing was thinking, I was saying. I know. I'm just teasing. I'm just teasing. Um, yeah, I'm not going to tilt it too far, but there. Here, move that thing. That comment. Oh, sorry. All right. right sorry. Away. There you go. Plastic. <laughs> yeah, it's just a loaded game. Very fantasy flight. Something I was going to talk about on this. They made uh, designers uh, this this book, which you can find actually pretty cheap out there. What's well, a cool idea? It's a scenario book, but the scenarios. Check out these guys who created the scenarios: John Hill, the guy who created Squad Leader; Frank Chadwick, Richard Berg, uh, Don Greenwood, Ted Racer, Joe Miranda, Mark Simonich, John Prados. I hope I got that right. Chad Jensen, Jason Matthews, Rick Young. It's like holy cow! How'd they get all these guys to make this? And are all these guys really into this system? That's pretty cool. Anyways, so that's when I say I want to go through the scenarios. This is one of the first things I want to do is go through all these because I've heard the scenarios in this book are really excellent. So, yep, and that's the neat thing. I mean, that's and you can really there bags you go. full of train. <laughs> Sorry, no, I, I even have I even bought the um, there's a, a whole terrain card like mini expansion, and that thing is like a brick, yeah. Oh, so, yeah. That's, I, yeah. I've seen that. That's one of the, I think that's the only thing I don't have for this is like, it's like blank, blank pieces of um, terrain. I mean, of map boards to make extra maps and stuff or make your own scenarios. I remember uh, part of my, uh, like my, uh, the reason well, I, I had it, I bought it. I wanted to give it, I thought it would win. Conflict of Heroes for me, one is the tactical system. But I loved how they had Stalingrad and all that. And then I actually thought, well, maybe this will gateway my son, who's now 13, into wargaming. <laughs> it didn't. I thought maybe the toy factor would grab him. Um, he's more of a role player, which is totally cool. But uh, that was part of my – I kept thinking, well, let me pick these other ones up. They're, they're inexpensive right now, and maybe he'll love it. So, But – Put the camera it. back. Oh, sorry. You don't like looking at yourself. I was wearing you're talking. I'm just going to go. Mm. You're right. I forgot. I forgot. All right. Um, I believe we're to your number two, right? Okay. Um, oh, something else when you mentioned about the, the, the Jones theory per se of war gamers, I went through the same thing you did because I had tons of these tactical systems 
And I ended up, on, I finally just realized, you know, Band of Brothers was what was clicking for me. Right. I got I got rid of squad leader. I mean, yep. don't really play with, because those who play would rather play ASL. You had Conflict of Heroes, you and Bub. So I was like, why do I need this Awaken the Bear copy I have? So got rid of it. Um, Advanced to Brooks system. Um, the Band of Heroes, the Lock and Load one. I mean, mm -hmm. I just got rid of a bunch of them. But I held on to Tide of Iron and Memoir. Because like, like I said, sometimes you just got to pull out your plastic and be awesome. You know, it's a, just a different feel, and I'm okay with that. It's not trying to be what those other games are trying to be. I agree. I agree. I'm thrilled that I held on to mine and picked up the other stuff while it was available. Yeah. Okay, my number two. Here. Elder Chore. Mm. You ever, have you ever played that? I have not. You are missing out. <laughs> um, it is uh cthulhu the whole um what's his name the dude that wrote that the arkham yeah. horror all that stuff yeah, they yeah. well that's what happened to me I, write them up here. I had uh, arkham horror and it uh was just way too much blah for me and so it stung me kind of on the cthulhu stuff you're just like me but the funny thing was the first time i played um arkham horror with aaron we had we were each playing two characters as cooperative, so no problem. And we got this blessing. It was like gives you a plus one die on success, and but you have to roll each turn. And if you roll a one, you lose your blessing. Mm. We took different dice, one, 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 and somebody else kept it. <laughs> it was that kind of a day. <laughs> I had a character who couldn't go inside of buildings. And he couldn't go outside of buildings. <laughs> like, well, other than going inside and outside, he's doing really well. And basically, <laughs> I got locked in this little building. It was like down a dead end road with all these super awesome, powerful monsters that would kill me in a second. So I had to stay hidden in this building, one of my characters, and do nothing. It was just, it was not fun. Now, we've played it again. It's okay. But Eldritch, now, Arkham is in a city. And I don't want to talk to this. It's not about Arkham. This is Eldritch. Sure. This is the whole Cthulhu thing. Uh, Lovecraft, thank you. Blanking in his name. It's worldwide. And it has a better feel. Instead of trying to do your investigating, you know, you got the gates, you're trying to stop this creature. Not necessarily Cthulhu. He's one of the guys you can have. But there's this horrible, bad, awesome villain guy who's awakening. And he's got these minions on Earth that's trying to help his cause. Um, it's cause, whatever. I don't know what the, about these dudes. But anyways, uh, <laughs> Yeah, well, you're going around the world investigating, and some cities might give you abilities to. You got character. You have individual character cards, just like a lot of these type of games, with strengths and weaknesses on there. You know, you might because they have an uh, basically like your mental health ability, your insanity level check, your strength check, right? And um, and then you got character traits. I remember like awareness and how well you deal with um, I don't know occultic spirituality type of things. If you're going to read books of of uh, spells and stuff anyway. And you might have to make checks during the game to overcome, to get to different levels. You get clue tokens, these clue tokens, you can cash in for things. Also you end up with these monster cards. There's like, um, uh, I think each monster has like five cards and you deal out three of them. So it keeps the game random. You put them face down, you flip it over and it, basically you have to conquer this thing. Like you might have to put five clue tokens on here on this card in order to cancel its effects and otherwise while it's still active this bad thing will happen and that's the key to winning is you have to beat all three of these objectives and are you the closing monster, doors the, are you trying to uh, close stuff you're not trying to no it's not, it's not really closing the gates gates will pop open and bad stuff will pop out horrible monsters will pop out of the gates that's why you want to close them and you don't have to go through the multiple steps of arkham to, to close the gates but um uh, Anyways, yeah, you you got you got to overcome his objectives to win the game. And there's a doom track, and certain things will move. You hit a certain phase of the game, you flip an event card, it might move the doom track. And um, when the doom track gets to zero, the monsters on Earth, and you're pretty much toast. Um, <laughs> um, but um, it's a it's I like the feel, the whole worldwide feel. And right. you're you, know, you got to buy tickets. You can. Move by C, but if you get a ticket, you can move two spaces for one move. Mm -hmm. And there's there's limited actions you can take and um, different bad guys, minions to fight. I have one. I had this idea brewing in the back of my head. I'm Because 
they make it now i don't know if they did now arkham went so huge aaron would go to bgg con and he had this group of people and they played all of the expansions they was in this yeah. big giant room with all these maps set up um i don't know if eldritch ended up just doing it's a fantasy flight thing we're just going to keep tacking it on scope creep and it gets massive um uh, but i got one expansion um i forget the name of it and i kind of stopped there because i was okay with it I, I liked what it did it added a few more objectives to each bad guy and added a new bad guy and his minions i just wanted to take one of the bad guys and re-theme him as bill belichick <laughs> and his minions were patriot fans <laughs> and do they go around looking because you can't can. get much more evil than bill belichick yeah, yeah a lot of trash can grabbing going on yeah uh, buying did they have like balls that they could deflate yeah, yeah that was going to come up you know when you're doing clues you find deflated balls you find camera equipment around you know all this different stuff related to the patriots and their numerous cheating ways um, <laughs> but um anyways i know you know, balance wise it would have been exactly the same as one of the other monsters i was just re-theming everything and it's one of the things i've i've got pictures saved because i got a good mm -hmm. picture of Belichick to make my card out of you for my need boss to do monsters. this yeah you yes, need to be awesome this now. yeah first of all <laughs> i want to play this game with you the idea that you had this and i know you're capable of doing this that's the funny part that's why <laughs> i want you to do it you're very capable it'll work it'll be perfectly themed and it'll be to the point that you'll get invited to the stadium to meet Belichick in person. That's what I think. You know, here's the funny thing. Yes, the man is pure evil, but he's <laughs> like the one, probably of all the coaches, he's the one we could most party with. He's a history buff. Okay, I didn't know that. He all loves the players it. on his team know the difference in Veterans Day and Memorial Day because he makes sure they know. Hmm. But I mean, he all kinds of historical references and stuff like that. I was like, dude, I could totally party with this guy. Other than he's pure evil and he'd probably steal my soul, but um, and then give it to his next quarterback to make him better than Brady. Oh, um, but uh, you know, I really wanted him to pick up Jordy Nelson because I thought, well, at least Jordy can you know have another. He's the kind of perfect kind of Belichick player. And but of course, Belichick knew I wanted this to, to sure. just to spite me. Yes. No, I'm not going to pick him up. Right. Um, but anyways, enough about him. But anyways, yeah, that was my Eldritch Horror thing. I, it's one of my little numerous side project things, along well, wanna, with making my Hannibal solo system and I'm um, a computer game and all that. I got tons of these ideas. It's just you know not enough time. But yeah, I, I've actually worked started some work on that and just you know work on it, put it up, work on it, put it up. Usually every time Aaron and I play Eldritch Horror, I'll get out for a few days and work on my Billichek expansion. Thought uh, when I got well, done, I'd post them on BGG. Well, I'll help you with that. You've got to teach me this game. I actually thought it used an app or something, and that's not, I'm not anti-app, but all right, we'll, we'll have to try that. I got turned off by the Arkham system at BGG Con. So uh, I had pre-scheduled to link up with some folks and we played, um, and supposedly we were playing a simpler scenario and I don't like quitting once I start a game. Mm -hmm. um, but there were two things going on. One, these, these folks, God bless them, were Uber Arkham fans. So they would be like, what you really need to do is this, 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 and that. And I was like, I hate, you know, even though I, I'm sure those were the best things to do. Uh, and it was probably frustrating for them to see how I was playing. I prefer to make my own mistakes, but, um, and then the thing drug on for four hours with very little, <clears throat> resolution and i told them how much longer and they said oh at least two hours based on what just happened and i'm like does someone want to take over my character and they were like what <laughs> when aaron and i played it was really obvious that we were the first time it was obvious we were going to lose i mean it's bad we'd close the gate they'd all pop right back open again it's like wow we just can't do anything right in this game and it was painful because um, what's the guy in Matrix say that she is going to die and there's nothing you can do to stop it? You know, it's like <laughs> that thing. I just like, dude, this is Morpheus. Doing. It's dragging on for hours for a game that's hopeless. It's one that you just really should have just put it up, and started again. Sure. But um, now, I, like I said, I played it again. We had a little more luck. I think we still lost. I don't remember. But I like Eldritch better. It's kind of like a lighter version of it. Okay. I and it's try. kind of easy to wrap your head around. Solo's great. 
um, nothing hidden in it, and it's purely cooperative, so you can see what everybody else is doing, and it's none of this competitive cooperative like Marvel Legendary. You all win, and you all die. Um, you, can, you can probably answer that question from Dave. I can't. Fortune and Glory, I like um, A Touch of Evil much better. Mm -hmm. Fortune and Glory is Indiana Jones, and it gets people excited. Um, it has, what's funny is there's these dudes, uh, scarlet something or other. They've got these red beak looking things on their face. Like, like it's a, almost like one of those fake noses and glasses things. And if you hit them and don't kill them, they gain dice. Like every hit you put on them, they get extra dice. And it's used in a bunch of their games because it's in, um, the touch of evil. And then it appeared in fortune and glory. And I hated those guys in a touch of evil. I mean, I just try to stay away from them because they're, they, it was one of those you almost killed them, but then they got really powerful and put a bunch of hits on you. Well, this time I had a gun, and I went and I sought them out. I'm like, dudes, I got a, I got a, you know, I got some business to square. But you got, you know, gunned them down. I'm like, yeah, what do you think about that? I got plenty of hits on you, punks. It's got that really cool Zeppelin piece, so the plastic gets people excited. It's okay. It kind of has a similar feel to A Touch of Evil. I just thought A Touch of Evil did it a lot better. It also comes in a coffin box, so keep that in mind, that it's going to be a storage issue. As far as Elder Tor versus um, whatever that fortune well, Lord, mm -hmm. I take Elder Tor every day of the week, twice on Sunday. Um, now, the better question is Elder Tor versus the Touch of Evil. Woo! I made my list of top 100 non-war games. I, I, I would put out my top 100 every year, but it's like three-fourths war games, so you see the same non-war games over and over and over. So this time I threw it out and said, yeah, one-time deal, fun. And I think, boy, those two came in at like four and five or something. I don't remember. I think A Touch of Evil might have edged it out. I don't know. It's one of those which depends on which one I played last. They're both that good. Well, you had Werewolf in your top ten. Yeah, not. Would the Mark Herman card take out the Belichick card? The Mark Herman card's the UN card. Um, <laughs> um, I knew you'd have an answer for that one, too. Yeah. Um, let's see, Fortune and Glory, A Touch of Evil. Yeah, A Touch of Evil is just, it's fantastic and killer expansion. I guess they're getting ready to do a follow-up, but that's Flying Frog. So. Sure. Um, but anyways, good. yeah, Eldritch Horror. If, I'm not a big Cthulhu guy because, I don't know, it's kind of like the zombies. Cthulhu games, they kind of, from what I've played, they kind of suck. And Aaron and I are very much, you know, Aaron's king of Ameritrash. And there was a Cthulhu card game, I think Fantasy Plight, Plight put out. It was a living card game. And yeah, I saw that. Something it of Cthulhu, I forget. It really good, I thought. It looks cool. He and I played it. It has even a cool Cthulhu plastic piece. We played that at Tornado Alley, and I come across saying, dude, this thing feels like a freaking Euro. Hmm. <laughs> I was like, um, and then we played it again, and it's like, because it was math, it very mathy. I'm like, yeah, you can't beat me here. So mathematically, you know, I'm doing the math stuff in my head like you do in a Euro, and I'm like, this doesn't have any theme. This feels like it's just tacked on. Hmm. And I want to say we played some other Cthulhu stuff and just haven't been really impressed. Now, I know Arkham is very impressive, especially if you like the big bloated feel and you like you really want to get into it huge. But Whoa. Eldridge, man, it hit the right. Plus, it's a lot shorter. I want to say Aaron and I play this. And keep in mind, we jabber the whole time. We're trashing the Patriots and KU and everything else while we're talking or <laughs> who knows whatever we're jabbering about. But so we play games slow. You know, it takes us four hours to play War of the Ring or some people are like, really? I'm like, well, you don't realize we, we jabber the whole time. Sure. Um, so I think we play Elder Tour in like three hours. It'd probably take normal people two hours. <laughs> so yeah. anyways, but very fun, very light, easy to get into. Solo's great. Killer theme. Very tense. So very few games I recommend higher for that, especially for the Ameritrash. Mm, nice. So I'm, I have spoken. Ooh. I'm going to do my honorable mentions. I have some here. So Tannhauser, um, all I'll say on Tannhauser, sadly out of print, but it's got a great, um, it's the first person shooter version of a war game or a, of a tactical game. So blinged out with some kind of interesting line of sight explained. Yes, it does. Twilight Imperium 3, it takes all day to play. I would uh, organize usually once a year. I've not gotten Twilight Imperium 4. I would get the buddies together. I liked how it has that epic space feel and um, the diplomacy that was involved. So, But uh, it would hurt feelings very easily. So after a while, I quit playing it because I was losing 
not friends, but they, they weren't thrilled. And then, um, oh, Mansions of Madness 2. I did not like the first one. It was too much setup. You know how I hate setup. Mansions of Madness 2 used an app the way I thought it should be. You literally lay one tile out on the board. You pick the scenario you're in. And then it's about like, it's like a, a mystery in a horror house or in a, a uh, haunted house. And you're paying attention and, and it did, it did cooperative play so good. I'll say it quiet so my son doesn't yell. No, I didn't. I, it made my son Bo scared so he wouldn't play it with me anymore. Because <laughs> it even has creepy music. And then like the, the eyes were watching us through the wall. And then he was like, I don't like this game. <laughs> I was like, you're scared. And he's like, no, I'm not. You but, know, Aaron and I was going to play Mansions of Madness. He, he'd been on me about, we need to try this out. You got to see this. And then COVID happened. Otherwise, I... It almost made my list, but uh, I didn't. I could have played it solo. It's so good at that. But uh, the cooperative strength of that game and the the theme that drips off using the app. And I do question how long will it work. You know, by the time you know you and I are sixty, there won't be an app for it. Ah, bah, somebody will come up with a patch or something. But it it works perfect. And you know my aversion to long setup, and it it solved that immediately cool. so those, those are my honorable mentions we'll go to my number one or did you want to do your honorables before I'll do you... mine real quick okay cold war kgb Ooh. versus cia if you're familiar with gmt's battle line kinesia it makes poker fun without money this makes blackjack fun without money it's a blackjackish like mechanic a lot of bluff going on in it and it has a pretty darn cool theme to how you deal with the sneaky pete actions of the cold war you're fighting yeah. battling over countries and yes. has a vassal module. But if you want it, you got to send me a mail. I think fantasy flight's not real cool with vassal being posting stuff out there, but it's perfectly legal to make them and email them to your friends. And everybody's my friend. So if you want one, send it to me because I made it. Rob and I played and plays great through uh, vassal. The one currently set up on my table, doom. Um, there's a second version of that. If you want to talk about it next week, we can chat all about it. <laughs> Kinesia, ingenious, um, fun dominoes kind of type of game. Yes, and Kinesia. We, yes. Um, let's see. I had one more that Aaron owns that I do not. Oh, Rune Wars um, has plastic mountains in it. And I've said all games should have plastic mountains. Starfleet Battles. Starfleet Battles needs plastic mounts. Submarine <laughs> needs plastic. All games because it is so awesome. It's like a Lord of the Rings type of ish game. Very fun. Lots and lots of plastic. And one Barton I used to love a lot more. If it hadn't been for your friends, it might be my number one. Battlestar yeah, Galactica. Yeah. I actually considered selling or trading this. I almost pulled a bonehead of trade and was considering trading it for uh, Merchants and Marauders in the expansion. That would have been a dumb trade. Um, I ended up buying them because <laughs> they're not that. I have a feeling if I hold on to this thing for a little bit longer, it's going to be my closest thing I got to a Queen's Gambit type of game. Oh, because it is. Because they lost the uh, rights to it, and they're and I don't think anybody's interested in picking it up. And it's an old enough TV show. It's not like Star Wars where it continues on. But I anyways. sold mine. Yep. So I thought, yeah, I'm going to hold on and see. Who knows? Maybe holds on. Maybe I'll get a few hundred bucks out of it. Um, uh, you would now. Really? I know yeah. those expansions go for a bunch. I've seen it go for around 100. But I thought, hey, I think if I hold on to it, and it's not a bad game. I don't know if I'll ever get into it because you need a big group to play it, not your friends who broke the game. Yeah, um, they played it like 200 times and knew the yeah. optimal move. So, uh, but if you play with people who do you know, in the show and aren't willing to do that, it's a, oh, man, that's some of the best sessions of a game I ever played. So, so those are my honorable mentions. So Dave, it's it's a great trader game until your buddies have played so much that on the very first turn that they get, don't tell, them, don't tell them the strategy. You'll break it for everybody. Well, I won't tell them which one. Apparently, there's a character that it's optimal for whatever reason. I still don't think it's optimal to just come out. So you come out as the uh, and you pull your trader move right away, and uh, instead of staying hidden, which is where all the fun and the tension is. First time I played that at BGG. Uh, we, I did a demo. I met Bixby. Um, uh, I played, I was a, uh, I was a uh, Cylon and it was so tense. 
and I'm just jacking with him behind the scenes. And, uh, I mean, every time I'd see Bixby anywhere in the con, he'd go Cylon. It was kind of like, you know, when, uh, your face that you do on uh, invasion, yeah, the body snatchers, it was that deal. And it was so much fun. And then my, my buddies literally, they almost bought another copy cause theirs was breaking down. That's how much they played. Oh yeah. All right. Um, somebody put a comment, never saw the, hadn't heard of the cold war. There's a star Wars version of it too. And we can talk about it during next week's show. This one's better, but I do own the Star Wars one also. So, yeah. See, look, the Pegasus. Time, we'll talk about it a lot because there's a lot of really cool games that got left off the list. Yes, some dude offered me a fortune for the Pegasus expansion. Yeah, that thing's going for nuts. That's got yep. the uh, the beautiful blonde Cylon gal on the cover, and a lot of people didn't buy it, so it's going for crazy. Now, not my number one, and this is interesting because I kept thinking I didn't want to put it here. And uh, then as I dove in a little deeper, I usually make notes, just, you know, ex extemporaneous notes on why the games are on. Because I'll usually come up with 10 and then I'll make notes and then I'll whittle them down. And I whittled it down to five and I ranked them. And I just kept saying, no, this, this needs to be here. And you already referenced it. It's Kinesia's Ingenious. Ah. I have played the heck out of this. This is a Domino's kind of version with... Two different colors. It expands two player. The board is set. It's a little more constrained. Three player. It goes out a row. Imagine a hexagon, but on a big, you know, the, the whole board's a hexagon. And then you can go out a row. And then if you play with four, you go out another row. Shows it on the back. Yeah. And it's so simple to teach. But what Kinesia did was amazing. You're pushing up colors on a track. And your your score, however, is your lowest color. So it doesn't matter if you ace out red, if green never gets off the starting line, your points might be one or zero. Yeah, if you maxed out four of your five colors, I think it is. Yeah. The fifth one is the lowest you lose. Yeah, well, yeah, that's your score is the lowest. So, I mean, uh, you get some bonuses if you max them out and get to 18. You get to take an extra turn right away, so that can be good. You definitely want to maximize your turn by playing the smartest play, but then you're working toward that. You're trying to bring everything up, everything up, and it doesn't matter if you race one far ahead if you don't bring the others up. And you can and, screw the other people over, block off there. You see that they yeah. got they, there's a big string of red and they need red to get up. I'm going to put this one here and block them off from getting any good reds. Yeah. And that's what Kinesia does so well there. As you play, you're rewarded with more play and the decision space isn't difficult, but the choices can be difficult. So it's not like I can't remember the rule for that. What page is it on? It's more like, wow, I want to do so many things or that's the optimal play, but what I really need to do is bring green up. So I'm going to take a suboptimal play because the optimal won't benefit me as much as that. And um, it's so easy to teach. And then as you play a couple, I literally been at the table and someone goes, Oh, and I go, Oh, they just, they just hit the next layer. And, uh, and I've, I've pulled this out before taught it once and everybody goes, can we play that again? Yeah. And then someone will drop off and they're like, well, I guess we can't play. Nope. Plays just as good with three. And, yep. and so it's, and it's always about 45 minutes and uh, it's, it was just clearly, and it's one reason Kinesia, I mean, I just love um, Kinesia's games. That's one of my favorite. And uh, there you go. There's my number yeah, one. Yeah. they. It's a game you can teach in a few minutes. Non gamers go for it. Also, don't be don't be worried about the colors. It has symbols, so colorblind people can play it. It might be red and an asterisk and green and a triangle symbol on it. So they thought that one out really well. 100%. Okay, my number one, give Joseph a, a prize. Yes. Woo! I mean, think about it. Theme, Ameritrash, Aaron and I. Yeah, it's <laughs> it's. I call it Kenitsi. I mean, not Kenitsi. Um. Tolkien, Tolkien in a box. It is. I have it as well. It Gorgeous plastic. Uh, sour, you're trying to two ways to win for the free people's biggest ones. Get the ring into Mount Doom. The second one is 
if if Sauron's asleep at the wheel and you can conquer so much of him of his territories, basically to keep Sauron in the game from just going overboard on looking for the ring. Uh, if Sauron can conquer so many places before you can get the ring in, he's over in Middle Earth, and it's you win. I mean, he wins. These games, every time Aaron and I play this, somebody's on Mount Doom and they're within two of hitting it. Either they're there and failing the roll. It's never the slaughter where oh, we're not even close to winning. Um, it's just tense, incredibly well balanced. Um, other companies have made this. I didn't even I didn't realize until I looked last night that I thought Fantasy Flight does make it. I saw the little symbol. I was like, woohoo, because this seemed like a total <laughs> perfect Fantasy Flight game. <laughs> this is the first edition. I have this, which I heard was too uh, much in unbalanced for Sauron, I believe it was. Then they made um, an expansion, which I heard tilted it too much the other way. Now, what I did is I skipped all that. And I, they got it right on the second edition. And if you want to know, go look at the BGG, look at the versions of it. What I got was a – Aaron got this for me at Geekway of the West for five bucks, ding and dent sale, upgrade kit that turned that into the second edition. Gave you the big cards also. Second edition has big, tall, long cards. Um, so I've got the second edition upgrade, which then after that, I've got the Warriors of Middle Earth expansion and the, uh, the one that has Galadriel on the cover. I forget the name of it. Um, the expansions are very good. They, if you're really geeking out on Lord of the Rings, it keeps adding more to the, without going overboard on the rules, it just adds more cool stuff. The Balrogs in one, he's kind of a jabroni. Um, <laughs> if you get him out of, if you get him out of the mines, he's a bum. Um, right. right. But in the mines, he's pretty tough. Same um, deal on the confrontation. Yes. So, uh, anyways, yeah, it's oh, if you get the first edition, the um, Oh, what do you call them? The the dudes that fly around, not the eagles, the, the bad Nazgals, Nazgals. Thank you, Nazgals, yeah. If you get them, they're tall. The second one, they wised up. They made it low, gave it a low center of gravity. If you get the first one, take a nickel or take a washer and glue it to the bottom. They won't tumble over them. Learn that trick from Aaron. One of the bummers about the game, now people who are into miniatures and painting, woohoo, this is for you. Uh, some of the guys are tough to tell apart, uh, on the especially on the um, free people side. We Aaron and I started referring to them as bony ponies because we look at oh yeah the bony ponies are these guys. Oh I saw somebody do it. BGD was pretty clever. They're kind of like me. They're not into painting, but they wanted a quick way to differentiate. They set them down there, took the spray paint can, and wow, all these guys are green. Wow, all those guys you know, and it's like a solid color, and you knew right away who was where. That that was a pretty slick idea. Yes. And it probably might ruin the value of your game if that's your thing. But if you're just into it for the play factor, that's one. That's another one of my mini projects is grab a few cans of spray paint and go out and paint these things. Um, let's see. Okay. So, yeah. Anyways, this I've played. And Aaron, Aaron, I think he has every, just it seems like it, every Lord of the Ring game ever made, it feels like. He has the old SPI game. Um, he has the. I asked him once about the Kenizia War Lord of the Ring, which didn't make either one of our list. I do own it. Mm -hmm. um, well, we can talk about it next week. I asked him, dude, that's kind of a Euro. What, what's what's with you, man? You hate Euros. He goes, you still have Kenizia's name on a box, and I'll pretty much buy it. Or not start today. Oh, boy, he'd shoot me for saying that. Uh, no, <laughs> Tolkien's name on a box, he'll get right. it. He even had some kitty Tolkien games we messed around with just for fun. But this one, this I'm one really, I mean, that, a lot of them have lots of cool little things, including... The, the Euro-ish kind of game has some cool factors, but this one really feels like Lord of the Rings. I've got a can you probably squibble and squabble that this little thing, this little thing. I mean, it's nice Tom Bombadil's a single card, so you don't really have to deal with him much more beyond that. But um, anyways, it's just exceptional. If you're into Lord of the Rings, if you're not into Lord of the Rings, I don't know. It's a, it's fun mechanics, but it really gets you immersed into the theme of it all. Um. Oh. Yeah, I'm That's the guy that if it's a Reiner game, if it's a Kenitsu game, I'm buying it. I love it. Yeah. Reiner. That's what I was talking about, Joseph's comment. Yeah, you put them on the board, especially when you mix them. It gets tough to see, and you think, oh, I got this. And then you realize, oh, I don't have it. I had the leader for the wrong group or whatever. And so that's part of why I saw that genius in mix, you know, painting them differently. Uh, I think Aaron said he just want to take a drop of paint and put them on the base of each one just mm. so you can see it a little easier. <clears throat> um. So yeah, um, and yeah, there's that Lord of 
Battle of Five Armies game. I don't know if Fantasy Flight put that out living card game or not. I haven't played it. Aaron has. I think he said it's pretty good too. But um, anyway, so yeah, that that gave me the best. That's when I was talking about them doing licenses. You know, they these guys have tons of Star Wars. Star Wars Imperial Assault. Aaron's been bugging me. We've got to play that. Then COVID happened. Right. I heard that game phenomenal. Well, yeah. Um, here's here's what Tom Tom not wanted to know why we didn't have that mentioned. Never played it. Aaron's the king of Ameritrash, and COVID kind yep. of pissed us yep. over. I played it once, and um, that's not my kind of – I mean, it's almost like they're kind of do skirmish, not quite tactical battles. It's like skirmish miniatures battles with some – and I it, it just wasn't – I played it once, and I was – and the theme's all there, but uh, I just couldn't. And the buddy I played it with, he painted them, and he, he just loved it. And he was mad because he couldn't get his group to play with him. I said, I love Star Wars. And then we played it, and I was like, hmm. <laughs> it just yeah. didn't work for me. Yeah, we've played Star Wars miniatures. So if it had any type of stuff along those lines, yeah, we'll go. And plus, Aaron and I just do lots and lots of Star Wars. But my understanding from what I was reading was the original Doom system that I have, they made a second Doom game and took it in a different direction. I don't know. I haven't played the second one. But it had its quirks I can talk about next week. They took it that system to Descent and kept ironing it out. And then they took it. I heard they took it to... Um, Imperial Salt and nailed it. Got a per got it down perfect. So I'd love to play it. So yeah, lots lots of sweet games we didn't cover today. Right. Well, the Imperial Salt kind of comes from the um. Oh shoot, I'm forgetting the Dungeon Crawler where they had the first edition, second edition. Did you just say it? I think claustrophobia, descent, descent. Yeah, not yeah. claustrophobia, but descent. And um, you know, so I mean, and they have an app for that too. My buddy was all thrilled about that. Now they also have oh shoot, what was the one that's evil where you're playing like these demons that come back? I'm, I'm blanking on. Uh, I I, no, I don't think so, and I have it over there too, but I can't read it from here because my eyes suck, <laughs> so I can't remember. Um, I think they did it. I could be totally wrong. We've covered everything though. We've done great. Um, uh, you know, I went yeah, and grabbed. Go ahead. So you want to know the scoop about Doom and the solitaire systems for it? Check in next week and bring it up. I'll chat about it. So yeah. On that note, everybody here, don't forget, put your list in the comments of this YouTube show because next week we come back and do the top five that the fans. So we'll go through the what the fans listed in the comments as their as their top five. And, uh, and then we have fun just talking about, you know, little sidebar things as well. So yeah. and since, we didn't, uh, since we didn't cover our first FFG game, we ever played, we'll have to get that next week. Uh, Dave claustrophobia was not put out by FFG. That was, um, Oh, Asmodee. <laughs> um, <laughs> what was, what was the or game? Asmodee, the or, I don't know how to say it. The board, the the board. I mean, it's a regular mounted board, but they made the map look like it was skin, like tanned human skin. And I'm blanking on the name of it. Um, so whatever, someone will know. I'm surprised it didn't pop up. You know, I hate when I'm sitting here and I'm thinking, why can't I think about it? I'll jot the names uh, of my other games I've had past from present before we start the next one. So if anybody wants to chat about those, also. I may be thinking of something that's not fantasy flight as well, because uh, that's it. All right. Anything else you want to throw in, Judd? New, well, tons of stuff, but we're already at an hour and 23. We are. So. We're out. We'll let her go. So everybody, thank you very much for tuning in. And as I coined in uh, my chaos in the old world, Daniel, ding, 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 ding. Daniel, dude. dude. That hey, is I got Merchants and Marauders, dude, so it better be as good as you say, because I got it because you said so. Yeah, the hell game. <laughs> Boom. He's the super genius behind um, Hands in the Sea, by the way, if you don't know. There you go. And then my new catchphrase after I did the show with uh, Tom Shaw is feed the niche. <laughs> so <laughs> we're in a niche hobby. Feed the niche. All right. See you guys later. All righty.